Okay, boys and girls, welcome. We are going to do a quick test review for your first exam, which will cover chapters one through three. Um, please feel free to review the videos that we placed on YouTube with regards to, to unit number one. Uh, we're going to go over those notes really quickly. Uh, once again, we're not teaching here. It's a review session, so please don't expect me to take time to go over every single concept in detail as I did on the other videos. So let's go ahead and start with the uh, first page of our unit. As you recall, we discussed matter. Please make sure for the exam you know the definition for matter and perhaps the difference between mass and weight. We then talked about the classification of matter and we broke matter down into two uh, categories, pure substances and mixtures. Remember, pure substances are only elements or compounds. Uh, as you recall, we did a little practice worksheet with um, identifying elements, compounds, and different types of mixtures. You might want to review that. So pure substances are elements or compounds. There are about 50 of those that you had to memorize the uh, proper symbol for and the properly spelled name. Um, once again, compounds are two or more elements chemically bonded together, not just mixed together. That would be a mixture, wouldn't it? And mixtures are either homogeneous, which are also known as solutions, or heterogeneous. So homogeneous would be something like uh, sugar dissolved in water. It's uniform throughout. Perhaps a mixture of zinc with copper to form brass. We don't have layers of zinc, and then copper, and then zinc, and then copper. It's a nice um, homogeneous solution. It's a metallic alloy. Uh, heterogeneous. We are going to have different phases, so if we put sand with water, if we mix fat with water, even milk, we said in class, was a heterogeneous mixture because those tiny little butter, um, butterfat globules do not dissolve in the water. They are suspended in the water. They make a colloid, which is also another heterogeneous mixture. Okay, let's see. Um, so we just defined homogeneous, heterogeneous, talked a little bit about phases, just remember that's a distinctive form of matter. An example, solid, liquid, or gas. We talked about compounds. We just talked about elements. But then we talked about properties, as you recall. And there are physical properties and chemical properties. So physical properties, uh, we'll see a characteristic that, that can be observed without changing the chemical identity of the substance. And we gave some examples. For instance, we said density. In fact, we did a lab on density. We found the density of several different objects. Did we change them chemically as we determined the density? Of course not. So density would be a physical property. We talked about intensive and extensive. Make sure you know the difference between the two for the exam. I'll probably have um, you choose which of the following is an intensive property. Or perhaps I might say which of the following is an extensive property. Or maybe I'll even ask you to give an example. Talked about physical changes. So we're changing the substance. Uh, excuse me, it's a change in the substance, but we're not changing its identity. So I can chop up paper. I can melt butter. I can saw a piece of wood. We still have chemically the same substances after that change has occurred. Uh, chemical properties. Now we have a substance's ability to undergo changes that transform it into a different substance. So iron can rust. That's a chemical property of iron. And the change of iron turning into rust is a chemical change once again because chemically we have something different after the process than we did before. So here I have hydrogen and oxygen gas. They react. It's a combustion reaction to form water. Water chemically is not the same as hydrogen and oxygen, so that would be a chemical change. However, if I took this gaseous water and condensed it and turned it into a liquid, I would still have H2O, but it would be in a liquid form. So that would not be a chemical change, that would be a, that is correct, physical change. Good job. Okay, we discussed some elements. Now, uh, make sure that you are aware that there are some elements where the symbol really doesn't match up too well with their name. I think we said there were 11 of those, and we really emphasized them. Make sure you know those, as well as the others that were listed at the beginning of your manual. Uh, those will probably pop up on the multiple choice section of the exam. So please review your notes and take some time to study those. Make sure, by the way, when you do it, that if there are two symbol, uh, two letters in this symbol, the first letter is always uppercase, second letter is lowercase. You with me on that? Okay, very good. 
Okay, this was a worksheet that we had played with. Uh, let's see, we did physical and chemical properties. If you haven't picked those up yet from your basket, you might want to do that and review those. Um, I could ask you on the exam questions very similar to what we did on these worksheets. I'm just paging through these very, very quickly. You should have your own copy. In fact, if you don't have your own copy, if you go to the Canvas page uh, and you go to the Files section, you can actually download your own copy. Um, you know, in the past we have had a few kids that struggled with uh, identifying whether or not we're working with an element compound, homogeneous mixture, or heterogeneous mixture. So if I gave you something like aluminum foil or gold foil, and all I had were those atoms, gold or aluminum, you should understand that that's an element. Concrete, you can envision as being a mixture of several different compounds, and it's not homogeneous. Um, you have big rocks and tiny rocks, sand particles, probably even air particles, maybe even some liquid if it's wet concrete. So you know it's not all the same phase. So that's a heterogeneous mixture as is muddy water and hamburger. Cologne, that's nice and homogeneous. You don't have to shake cologne up before you use it, do you? Not any that I've ever used. It's uniform throughout. Uh, let's see what we have here. Then we talked a little bit about the periodic table. Um, make sure, folks, that you know what groups and families are. If I asked you to identify the group and family for cobalt, you would say, okay, well, that's group nine. It's the ninth group over from the left and period number four. Um, groups are the ones, kiddos, that go up and down, those that are vertical. Um, and the uh, periods are the ones that are horizontal. Now, these two down here, uh, they actually do not form their own periods. These elements actually fit in that one box, so they belong in period six, and these elements down here at the bottom fit in this box, so they actually belong to period number seven. Don't worry so much about those. I probably won't put them on the exam. But do, however, know what groups and uh, families and periods are. Make sure you know that metals are on the left, and the periodic table has many more metals than nonmetals, which are on the right. And metalloids, for the most part, are right along that staircase. There are a couple of exceptions that we mentioned. So the metalloids are going to be boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium. To get boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium. And they're right on that staircase. So please be able to identify where the metals are, where the nonmetals are, and, of course, where the metalloids are. Also, we probably should understand that this last group, these are called the noble gases. Uh, group 17, these are called the halogens. Group 1 are called the alkali metals. And group 2, these elements are called the alkaline earth metals. Then we got into measuring and calculating, and I asked you to read in your textbook with regards to the scientific method. I know there's a video where we went through and discussed the scientific method. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you might want to review that. But that's something you did not only in elementary school when you did your science fair projects, but you also beat it to death in junior high. So I don't know if I need to spend as much time on it. We'll be applying the scientific method in our laboratories this year, but you should just maybe review that in your textbook at the beginning of Chapter 2 on your own talked about accuracy and precision. Accuracy is how close a measurement is to the correct value, and precision is the closeness of a set of measurements. I would expect to see that in some type of multiple choice question. So you can see that this individual here was not accurate or precise. This individual here, actually if you take an average of his four attempts, the average might be somewhere around here on my target. So you'd say, yeah, that guy was accurate, but he certainly wasn't precise. This individual here, well, he wasn't accurate because he missed his target, but he was precise because he was able to repeat that over and over and over again. And this person down here did exceptionally well. He was accurate and precise. So I think we talked about um, an experiment that we did, and we took some measurements and, and looked at our accuracy and our precision in one of our videos. Scientific notation is pretty straightforward. Now, once again, the only math, well, I shouldn't say the only, most of the math we do in this class is going to be addition, subtraction, and primarily multiplication and division. You've learned that in all, many of the examples and homework problems we've been on. So please, don't get too worried about the math. Um, please think through the process 
and know when you are to divide, to divide or multiply or add or subtract. Scientific notation, we spend a lot of time talking about those zeros not being significant because I can write this number in scientific form and I don't need those zeros. So they're not important and we just say they're not significant digits. The same is true with the numbers smaller than one. Sometimes those zeros we just don't need so we say they are not significant. We looked at some measurements and if I gave you a picture like this on the test you should be able to choose in the multiple choice format you know, the correct measurement um, of that, well I'm going to call this a piece of paper here with regards to that ruler or the liquid in that graduated cylinder. Remember you can write down all the digits you know for sure plus one estimate. So please remember that. Alright, let's see, what else? Um, once again, how many digits are we allowed to estimate? Only one. After that it becomes guessing. So there are some significant figure rules in your textbook. That's on page 47 if you have the blue book, which most of you do. We can go through this really quickly. Remember, there are no non-zero digits in this first measurement, so all those numbers are significant. This zero is between non-zero digits, so all of those digits are significant. Once again, these zeros here, we don't have to have. We can write that number in scientific form without those zeros, so only these two digits are significant. Same is true with 245,000 kilometers. If you write this number in scientific form, those zeros are not important. Now, one important thing, if I put a dot at the end of that, we said, then those, uh, the individual that put that dot there meant to tell you that the zeros before that dot are significant. So that is one exception. Um, four significant figures here. If a number ends in zeros to the right of the decimal, those zeros are significant. Uh, that's E and F. And counted numbers and definitions, remember, have infinite number of significant figures. Then we talked about some um, arithmetic when working with uh, measurements. Remember, our answers cannot be any more accurate than our measurements. So if I measure the dimensions of a room and I say, well, it's 8.3 meters wide by 4.3 Eight, three meters deep, I have two significance in my, uh, significant figures in my first measurement, three in my second measurement. Even though my calculator says all of those numbers, I'm only allowed two significant figures in my answer. So I have to round that out to two digits, four, zero. So I have the four and the zero. I put a dot there to let the reader know that that zero is significant. Or I could write it in scientific form and get my two significant figures. Remember, the rules for adding and subtracting are different than multiplying and dividing. When you add numbers together, remember, you look at decimal places. So if I have 12.52 centimeters, 8 centimeters, and 72.3, I like to line the decimals up. When I get my number uh, through addition, or if I'm subtracting, then I take a look at my decimal places. This is to the nearest hundredth, nearest whole number, nearest tenth, my least accurate is to my nearest whole number. So I have to round that to the nearest whole number, which turns out to be 93. We did example four. You might want to review the video to see me do that again if you're unsure. Don't forget to bring a calculator, please. I have like two calculators in my room that I can loan out. That's it. So please be responsible. Bring your own calculator. You may not use your cell phone. Please don't even ask. Or your iPod. You may not use those as calculators. Okay, I think we'll wrap up uh, the first part of our review here. I'll make two parts for you. So part one is over. Uh, we'll start, uh, maybe we'll go over this worksheet. You might remember that. I think we called it assignment 3B. Uh, during the, the second week of the school year. We'll review that maybe at the beginning of the next video and continue on. Thanks for watching. I hope this helps you out. Stay tuned for part two. Bye-bye.